Shalom, welcome to The Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad of Dahmer, together with my co-host, Mark Rohn at Just Statewide News Service and jbiztechvilly.com. And can we add also regular columnists for the Jewish press? Thank you. And it's a pleasure to do the Albany Beat column and talk and see how government relates to the Jewish community up here in Albany. So Excellent. that's what it focuses Everybody should on. be reading. So we have a return guest with us today. Uh, mm -hmm. Assemblyman David Buckwald from Westchester County, mm -hmm. White Plains. So welcome to the, back to the Jewish View. It's a pleasure to be back. Thank and you. And a hearty mazel tov to you. Six weeks ago you had a baby girl. Uh, well, biggest joys uh, I could imagine and every day continues to grow. So uh, thank you both. Well, I really, I, may you only have simchas and nachas with us. Thank you. Um, thank you. I wanted to bring up something that because we uh, recently it was learned that uh, another assemblyman has been felled by a corruption scandal, and you have a sponsor, you a sponsor of the bill that would remove uh, the pension benefits from anyone convicted of a felony, of any elected official or a state official. Mm -hmm. You know, you can give me the details on it, but sure. let, yeah, tell tell us what's going the, on with that. The current circumstances are that no matter how egregious someone's actions in public office, they are entitled to their state pension forever, no matter what. And I, and I think many New Yorkers, feel that someone who commits a felony uh, in violation of the public trust is someone who simply hasn't earned their full pension. Uh, and so we need a constitutional amendment in order to allow a judge to uh, decide whether it's appropriate to take some or all of a person's pension away. Um, and I've been a champion of this concept since I entered the State Assembly a little more than two years ago. Um, we're now on the verge of uh, passing a constitutional amendment. And there are certainly still uh, uh, items re regarding that amendment and the associated uh, statute that are being worked out. But I believe that we're going to have success. Uh, in large part because New Yorkers really think it's about time that well, we take these Why steps. do you need an amendment just to have the civics part of it, the legality of, of it? So our state constitution very sensibly has a rule that says that state pensions cannot be diminished. Really and that sense, right? makes sense as a general proposition because uh, employees of the state, who the vast majority of whom work tremendously honorably and contribute so much to our state, they spend their working years uh, uh, providing their services, mm -hmm. and it would be wrong to take their pension away after they're already um, retired. retired. Yeah. Um, the, so that's a good general rule, but what we've learned over uh, you know, the last few years especially is that there is a narrow sense in which that rule simply leads to the wrong result, and that's a situation where for example, folks are continuing to get pension credit for the time that they were engaged in corruption. Um, there are folks who are sitting in jail collecting state pension checks. Um, and it's not as much the fact that that means uh, tax dollars are really being misspent, although that's definitely part of it. It's also just the sense of, you know, what message are we sending in terms of what the value is of a pension and why we as a public should be committed to our public employees. It's because of the good work that they do, not because of merely the fact that they were uh, in office. And that's really it where we're trying to draw that distinction. It doesn't seem as though you're having much success in the state senate. Now you have 90 sponsors in the assembly, so that automatically means that you could pass it on its own. So that's actually, uh, it's a little bit of uh, deceptive given the way some of the bills have moved their way through the process. The state Senate has, in fact, already passed this constitutional amendment, passed by a vote of uh, 52 to 10. It's a version of a uh, constitutional amendment that the governor proposed as part of his state budget process. I'd obviously been a sponsor of a bill on the subject for a couple of years, but the, uh, Governor Cuomo uh, stepped up to plate recognizing the importance of this issue uh, earlier this year. So he proposed an amendment. The uh, assembly and the uh, governor came to an agreement on ways to uh, modify that and provide 
protections, for, for example, for family members who might be affected. Uh, so is your bill uh, null and void? Because no, because the, because the uh, first of all, I carry two bills. So yeah, I have my so original bill, yeah. and I have uh, essentially the modified version of the governor's oh, bill. Okay. And I'm the sponsor of both. Um, you know, obviously, my personal views are reflected more in my original bill, but they're very similar. Uh, and in any case, um, the Senate's passed a bill oh. on this front. And so now we're at the point where the Assembly is working its way through it's this process. And we're, we're able to you know, make sure that we end up at a good place uh, for, for New Yorkers. It's interesting because you said that the, you know, there were, it says here 15 senators in 2014 signed on. But right. yet in 2015, boom, it's just like everyone decided well, to. I think that's actually an important thing for the public at large, and always I say this to advocates as well. There is a difference between co-sponsoring yeah. a piece of legislation and willingness to vote for it. Right. So for example, I make decisions all the time of what bills am I going to co-sponsor. Often those things are things that are either particularly important to my district or particularly important to constituents in my district or something that I personally feel either I have expertise on or particularly passionate about. That's not to say that there aren't many, many other bills that are fine bills that I will gladly vote for, but they're not ones I'm going to co-sponsor because when you co-sponsor, that's a sign of you've examined the issue all the more thoroughly and you feel that this is something that really represents your uh, highest set of priorities. And I think that's an example of that is the MMA bill? Right, so that's one thing that right now is uh, under arts, discussion yeah. because there are a lot of members who have signed on as co-sponsors of that bill, but there also are a lot of members uh, who feel that would vote for it. But there are also a lot of members who aren't on the bill who are definitively against uh, passage of a bill like this. And so, but that's, there's a distinction between you can be not on the bill and still willing to vote for it, you can be not on the bill and be actively opposed to it. We don't really have a way in the state legislative process of, you know, publicly formally in connection with the bill registering your opposition until the bill comes to a unless vote. There's, and, let's say with uh, mixed martial arts, unless there's a, a, another bill, separate bill, that, that outlaws mixed martial arts in New York State. I suppose then, you could have something like that. And then you can have yeah. two competing bills, the, like the one point. for, one against, and you see who signs on and how many of them sign on to both. Right. What's, what's your position? So my, my view is I've relatively recently become a, a sponsor of the bill um, because I've heard the from bill enough. bill to allow it? Which would allow it because it's allowed in 49 states yeah. in the country. It is available to folks on their televisions. Um, you know, the influence of it, that it has on society is already pretty well established. Um, and I've heard from enough constituents who would be interested in going to see uh, uh, mixed martial arts uh, events well, here have, in New York State. You have a major venue in White Plains. I mean, would they have mixed martial arts uh, events in the White, I forgot the name of it. The, the, the Westchester County yeah. Center, uh, which, is, which is in my uh, district. That would really be up to the Westchester County. They're the owner of the facility, so, you know, for but example. But that could be a facility that would have a mixed martial arts. It's the type of place that yeah. you could have. I mean, it's, right. not, it's not as big as Madison Square Garden. No, of course uh, not. Neither is something uh, here But, for example, the Westchester Knicks, yeah. uh, uh, a developmental league uh, team uh, within uh, the NBA, pl play at the Westchester County Center. Yeah. And they're uh, a new team, uh, ex exciting love. A number of my friends are season ticket holders. And, you know, certainly part of the argument for mis mixed martial arts is that we want more of that economic activity to occur in New York. So, also, but so I, just, I would just think, the Mark, that it's almost a slippery slope because, I mean, if you can make against mis mixed martial arts, which, you know, I wouldn't go to, I don't know, boxing, I, I just don't, right. too violent for me. But again, just cause I don't want to impose my views on anybody else. But they could say about football, there's these all these mm -hmm. issues now, the concussions on football players, you could also say that's... It's, you know, very violent and ban um, pro football. That's certainly been one of the issues that uh, I and my colleagues have been grappling with, which is where do you draw that line? And some people will say that they would like to draw the line at a much more restrictive uh, approach and, and be consistent with that view. Of course, one of the, the challenges as a legislator is you can have an overall worldview, but you only get to vote on individual specific bills. 
And so you have to make your decision as to, well, how do you approach this bill given where we are? So do you have this theory or philosophy if they want to knock their heads against the wall and they want to kill each other, let them go well, to the ring and so, let, them, let them bang each other. You know, it's a free country. If that's what they yeah. want to do willingly, let them do it. You know, so, certainly not if it's literally killing each other. <laughs> but, you know, I think, I think part of the argument uh, for allowing this under the auspices of, you know, the governmental regulatory bodies like we have for boxing, right. uh, for example, is with a set of rules and procedures, including safety procedures and presence of doctors and things like that in place, it can be a relatively controlled and if not uh, entirely safe, at least not so dangerous that it you know, well, would shock the conscience. Let's see what happens when the first death happens in New York in the ring there. And then. <laughs> you think it will pass this session, though? It, that's exactly the question that's uh, being debated right now in the Assembly of should this bill come right. to the floor? Because it's been a debate topic well before I was in the right. uh, State Assembly. Um, you know, I think that people on, on both sides are, you know, genuine and heartfelt in right. how they approach this. Um, and so that doesn't make it a particularly easy decision. It's a lot easier when you really feel the other side is wrong. Because yes. then you're willing to just proceed full speed ahead. Um, but this is an issue where we've got to take into account various members' views. Maybe there are ways to update the bill to try to take in some of those uh, uh, points. But that's a decision that, as a Democratic conference as a whole in the state assembly will have to make, okay. and we'll, we'll uh, see how it develops during so, the course of the legislature. Let me move on to another topic, the uh, education investment tax credit. Mm -hmm. uh, you have yeshivas in your district, maybe uh, one, two. Sure, okay. I do. Yep. And you have uh, certainly parochial schools. Absolutely, and I have right. public schools, which right. you know, would part benefit from the, the education yes. tax credit has, at least many of the uh, versions of the bill, it has a, a component that would uh, benefit public schools right. as well. So. Tell me, are you one of the co-sponsors on... I'm not one of the co-sponsors, but I've also taken a pretty middle-of-the-road approach. Are you power on, of on it? <laughs> there you go, maybe. <laughs> the, um, the, um, I come at this somewhat from a maybe different perspective than many of my colleagues. Uh, as you know, Mark, professionally, I was a tax attorney before I entered the... Uh, state assembly. Technically, I'm still an attorney. I keep up my law license, but I don't, uh, you don't practice. practice. Okay. Um, uh, no outside you know, income. Huh? No outside income. Okay. Um, it's a whole uh, topic. You know, from from uh, that line of work, it's you know, to me, I have many more tasks than there are hours in the day. Okay. Uh, especially now with a, a six week old. Uh, but um, I look at this somewhat from the perspective of a tax attorney, and obviously. Most of my colleagues are looking at it from other um, understandable uh, public policy viewpoints. Um, and so I know that in general, we, you know, especially uh, to this degree, we don't tend to have uh, uh, tax credits as opposed to tax deductions, which of course are always available for contributions to not-for-profits um, for items like this. Having said that, I also know that there would be significant benefits that would come from being able to uh, have money go uh, to both private and uh, public schools. And I'm sure a number of uh, schools in my assembly district would uh, uh, take advantage. The, so I've taken a you know, relatively neutral approach. I'm not uh, um, What's your willing what, what to- What are your reservations? My, my, my reservations are, first of all, just the, the general yeah. overall cost to the you know, state Finances. That's it's a significant amount of hundred million dollars, right? Well, there have been different proposals. Right. Some of them have been up to three hundred million dollars a year. Right. Um, well, some of the more recent discussions have been a, a, a hundred million, but that was the part of the governor's right. budget proposal. Um, and it was it was also went back and forth as to would that be just for private parochial schools? Would that include a share for public schools? No, that, it's fifty fifty. Know, yeah. Different versions have had different okay. uh, aspects of it. Um, and so I've sort of decided I'm, I'm not uh, um, going to be a co-sponsor because I basically feel there's a lot that I still want to see worked out as part of uh, this as. discussion. So, for example, it is, it is very important to me that public schools have 
50% of the access to this. It's also important to me that we try to, as much as possible, spread out you know, the number of participants in a tax credit like this. So one of the questions has been, well, you know, how large of a tax credit can any one individual uh, receive under this mm -hmm. proposal? Because this is a different type of tax credit than, say, you know, the tax credits <coughs> that are available uh, for putting in an energy efficient window in your house. There only are so many windows in someone's house, and therefore this solve is inherently a cap on how much any one person can get from a tax credit like that. Giving money to uh, worthy uh, educational <coughs> institutions, there's no inherent limit on that. And there are some limits in, in bills like this, but not all of them are you know, uh, as definitive as making sure that we try to spread the benefit and from the taxpayer perspective in addition to the school perspective. And some of the uh, bills or whatever say the maximum of a million dollars from one individual. Right, I think that's been an example of things, and but that's obviously a pretty uh, uh, high amount, especially if you're talking about a total amount of 100 million. Right, so now people say, you know, people in the legislature who have reservations about this are saying, well, let's lower that limit. Mm -hmm. That's, let's I think, one of, the, no one of the things, and, you know, it's part of why, because I try to do a pretty uh, rigorous process, go through a rigorous process before I co sponsor or multi sponsor a bill in the state assembly. If I'm the type of person who I feel like I still have questions or I want to make sure that I have, you know, more of the ability to influence where things, uh, how things proceed on a particular piece of legislation, I'll hold back on co-sponsoring a bill because it gives me more flexibility, frankly, than once mm -hmm. I've self-committed myself. Co-sponsored, you're committed, and it would be awful if you voted against something you co-sponsored. Well, sure, surely. Yeah, yeah I, that's definitely, you know, I never tr would want to get into that situation, and that's why yeah. I take seriously. I, I do ins insist someone, you know, wants me to co-sponsor a bill, I say, well, can I make sure I see the text of the bill so I know mm -hmm. what's in it and does it, you know, fall in line with what I think the bill's aimed to do. And every once in a while, I'll find something that the author of the bill didn't intend to be saying, but every once in a while, the way it's been phrased, it could be misinterpreted a different way, and I'll go to the sponsor and they'll make a change, or we'll, we'll, we'll work that way through the committee process. The bill the Senate passed in mm -hmm. January for yeah. the EITC, uh, did you read that? I know it's being redrafted, and then there's conferences, and they're reworking it, so the Senate will have to vote again on whatever the new bill yeah. is. But did you read the bill that the Senate I've, passed? I've read at least many uh, parts of it. It's been similar to versions that have been there in the past. So um, that one was, for, for example, closer to the $300 million Do you not uh, like level. that one? Would not you like it's again? a... Would, if you had a vote on it on yeah. the floor, would you vote yay or nay on that? So. I, I, I think that version is probably more excessive than I'd prefer. So you would so, vote, so, so so, vote against it? Because it, it's too excessive. It, it, look, if, it, if, it, if a very specific bill like that came forward, I'd, I'd basically say, this is not where we should be. I'd rather right. uh, have the negotiations continue. And if the only way to have the negotiations continue is to vote, uh, it, down. vote, vote yeah. it down temporarily, then that's right. the way to ha have to do it. You know, obviously, by the time a bill actually comes to the, a vote in the, on this floor of the state assembly, especially if it's one that has already passed the state senate, it's usually at the point where negotiations have already occurred. Right. So that, um, in fact, in, at least in the past few years, the, on this piece of legislation, the assembly and senate versions have almost never been matching versions. So they've, they've uh, never, there's never actually been an assembly version of the, 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 the well, exact we call senate same bills. as what we exactly. call the same as. So let me ask you, in the, the sponsors, there are, again, like 90 assembly sponsors on the EITC one, mm -hmm. versions of the bill. Yep. So, but a lot of them are the Republican, assembly Republicans. Mm -hmm. is, it, is there some unwritten rule that if there's a majority of the sponsors are not from just the, the Democratic conference that the bill won't move through because then the Republican, Assembly Republicans will take a credit for helping to get such and such bill passed? Yeah, I, I don't have that rule. I've always but, taken the approach that 
any member of the assembly who wants to sign on in support of one of my uh, bills. Right. I don't mean about that. I mean, in the, is there a conference rule that says the bill won't be? I, I think it's let, from the Democratic conference perspective, and I obviously can't speak on behalf of the conference, but from well. what, what I, the way so I see things being approached, the focus is more on how many Democrats support it. And right. the number of Republicans that su support it is less relevant. But if and that are, makes sense from a Democratic conference right. perspective. Right, so if there are fewer than 76 Democrats supporting the me a measure, would there be a reluctance to let it out of yeah. I, I, onto I, the floor? Yeah, I think first of all, of course, remember that support for a measure is different than number of co-sponsors, as we already discussed. Well, But there, there are a number of different approaches that legislators have taken and that legislatures have taken over the years. So for example, in the U.S. House of Representatives, there's uh, pretty uh, famously developed about uh, uh, 10 or 12 years ago, what's called the Hastert Rule, yes. named after the former Dennis speaker of the, of the House of Representatives, who said that no bill will come to the floor of the House of Representatives unless it can get a majority vote of the Republicans, meaning mm -hmm. half of the Republicans plus one have to support it. That is different than saying that in the U.S. House of Representatives, since 218 votes is a majority of the entire House of Representatives, that 218 Republicans have to support it. And in fact, what you've seen over time is that there are crucial occasions where both uh, Speaker Hassett, but now Speaker Boehner, have said a majority of our conference is willing to vote for something, but we are willing to reach out to Democrats and find ways to get them to support things because Frankly, there are, I think it's fair to say, parts of the Republican Party in the U.S. House of Representatives who are just unreasonable and not going to agree on what makes for good right. public policy. And although and uh, Speaker Boehner doesn't always recognize that, uh, sometimes he does, and it's good that he does because it's, it's a way to enable Democrats in the House of Representatives to help shape public policy, which in general... But it's, it's but, but it's not as lopsided in the House of Representatives as it is in the State Assembly in the sense that over two-thirds of the State Assembly are Democrats. So the, really the Assembly Republicans are inconsequential right. in a lot of ways. But I'm just, I, 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 we got to move on. But I just yeah. wanted to know if there was any written or unwritten rule, unspoken rule about, all right, we'll let this go. Because Kathy Nolan, who's head of the Assembly Education Committee, is against this EITC, mm -hmm. she has said that to me personally on several occasions. Fair and I'm not sure, you know, uh, you know, she's bottling it up. So I'm not sure, and she says it's unconstitutional. I don't know if you feel that way, but, you know. You know, it's, it's one of these things that I think different members take into account the views of their colleagues in form, creating their own views. So for example, there will be times when I will feel on some public policy matter you know, I be, might be fine with this, but enough of my colleagues feel uh, so strongly opposed to it that I want to take that into account in creating my own mm -hmm. view, just like if I were strongly opposed to a piece of legislation, I would want my colleagues to take into account how vehemently mm -hmm. I feel on that subject. Yeah, because so, you don't live in a so, bubble in, or in a vacuum in the mm -hmm. assembly. And part of it is, and this is true in politics more generally, including in the electorate more broadly, there are times when because a group of either New Yorkers or United States uh, uh, citizens feels really strongly on something, they might not be a majority of the population at large, but they feel so strongly on it that we actually decide as a society, we want to value their views on things. You know, one you know, area that's been recently in, in the news, but it certainly hits on this point is, you know, there's a, you know, a dynamic of the U.S. relationship to Cuba that in part was based on the Cuban-American community in the United States and their views on the uh, regime of Fidel Castro. And no one said the Cuban-American community is close to majority of the population in the United States. Right. But there was value in taking into account their views in setting U.S. policy. And I should say, one of the great things about this country mm -hmm. is that um, it's taking into account the views of Jewish Americans. Mm -hmm. Even though we're only a 
few percentage uh, mm -hmm. points of, of the total population. It, real good. And, and that's one of the areas that I think has made the United States so strong is that we have sort of an inherent respect for minority groups informing the overall right. viewpoint of how are mm -hmm. we going to make decisions as a society. Excellent. So, so let me ask you, you're not on the Higher Education Committee, but there's something that is near and dear to your heart that you wanted to, uh, that we wanted to bring up with you, and that is the issue of anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic acts on college campuses. Right. I mean, this is something that across the United States, but also here in New York, has unfortunately been on the rise. Really? And... Because um, I don't see it in the University of Albany or any other... Well, not campuses that you know, well, for, for example, there have been a number of uh, uh, instances at Cornell University, at my own district, uh, SUNY Purchase. Really? Uh, um, a, uh, a few months ago, there were um, uh, swastikas painted on campus, as well as nooses, uh, both very offensive um, uh, acts. And um, there's been an arrest in the case of the... Uh, young, uh, like actually, in the case of the swastika uh, 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 graffiti and so forth, and you know, I think part of uh, what's happening on campuses is first of all, a lot of uh, young Americans don't have a full se sense of appreciation of the history regarding a lot of these issues, and why, first of all, why. Um, uh, showing uh, uh, hate-filled uh, images like swastikas and nooses is such a dis disturbing thing. Uh, but also, I think that there's been a you know sense that you know, in part because of the uh, political dynamic, that you know, folks don't really understand the value of the Israeli-U.S. relationship and how much um, Israeli values are very much in keeping and, with, his, with and what's U.S. I, values. What's ironic is that you're talking about a lack of awareness of what these symbols mean and how hurtful they are, and it's on a college campus where education is paramount, and you're, you know, and you just these kids are not being educated about what that, that they shouldn't be doing this on a on college campus. Well, I mean, it's just amazing. You know, Mark, it, unfortunately, I mean, we have precedents for it. Germany was in a third world country in World War II. They were the leading scientific uh, community, and they were very, very educated. But just because you're educated in one field doesn't no, I just mean that you're tolerant right. in the other. No, it's ironic that it's, I know, you it know, is. here, here it is, an educational institution that could take steps to mitigate this from happening, and they're not it, taking the and, educational steps. And I think sometimes, first of all, it's important to point out the institutions themselves are actually doing a pretty good job, but um, they, th there's a sense at times of what develops on campus. And again, not just here in New York, there have been plenty of instances right. in the University of California system and elsewhere, where um, the sort of rhetoric that would be viewed as completely unacceptable for many minority groups on campus and in society, for some reason when it comes to Jewish members of that community, somehow that rhetoric is viewed as, if not more acceptable, at least something to more to be put up with. And it just simply isn't. So and I think that's an important message that we all can send. Are you sponsoring a bill uh, to combat I, I, this? I, 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 so I have been uh, in discussions with folks when it comes to things like, for example, cyberbullying, which yeah. uh, relates to the level of uh, hate, particularly amongst uh, young people on, on campuses. But I've also been, uh, been active in my local community. I'm on the Westchester Advisory Board of right. the Anti-Defamation League, uh, for example. This is a new board that's been uh, established uh, in the last year. And you know, I used to be able to, to say that I wasn't aware uh, in recent times of events in my assembly district that were anti-Semitic. I can't say that anymore, mm -hmm. in part because of the uh, SUNY purchase uh, right. uh, occasions and so forth. But, but are you sponsoring a measure or bill? So I don't. Right now, I don't yeah. have a specific okay. bill. But part of this is less, I think, a matter of you know legislating tolerance or, or so forth, 
then creating an, an environment. There have been uh, uh, bills discussed uh, in years past about you know, the connection between uh, college campuses and you know, the movement to uh, boycott goods from Israel. I'm a big believer that that's completely antithetical. To, the, the boycott mm -hmm. is completely mm -hmm. antithetical to openness of exchange of ideas and views, and particularly in connection with college campuses where they are inherently all about the free exchange of mm -hmm. ideas. Well, but Pepsi uh, in your county, not in mm -hmm. your district, was a boycotted Israel for many years, and I never drank Pepsi because of that. Now they lifted the boycott, but they boycotted Israel. Well, I'm glad years. you can drink Pepsi again. That's right. Uh, <laughs> be healthy. All right, That's listen, good. Mark, we're out of time. I want to thank you not thank only you, for uh, representing the good people of Westchester and, of course, New York State, but sticking up for the Jewish community around the world. So keep up the good work with a lot of success and a lot of nachas pleasure from your new daughter. And thank you much so much. Success, yes. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Mark.